We talked about a shooting even going back to 1997. Talk to me a little bit about what the border was like five years ago versus today in terms of the amount of troops, the amount of people being massed on the other side of the Mexican border who can't even get to an asylum officer. Tear gas now happening that never happened before. And were there more people at the border five years ago than today? Right now, we have some of the lowest numbers of people trying to get into the country that we've had in the last 40 years. But let's go back to 1994, because 1994, that's when the United States decided to build a wall with Mexico, when about a decade earlier, President Reagan had said, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. And then in 1994, the United States builds a wall, which covers 700 of the 2,000 miles of border between the United States and Mexico. That wall has led to the death of 11,000 people. Marco Antonio Villasenor, a five-year-old boy that dies with 18 men, after he went around the wall and crossed into Texas. You have his uh, Lucrecia Dominguez that died in the arms of Jesus, her 15-year-old son. So people have been dying in record numbers since 1994. One of the things that's changed in the last years as we go closer to 2019 is that you have uh, somebody that's in Washington, D.C. that's not qualified, striking up all this fear, and he says that he's going to build a wall. He hasn't built one inch of new wall. What he has done is the same thing President Obama did, President Bush did, which is rebuild part of the wall where there's holes or some of the walls falling down. So he's just replacing part of the wall. He might be making it taller in certain areas, but undocumented might migration is at a very low level. The walls don't, don't stop people, the walls kill people. And the people that, when we talk about stopping the drug situation, that's driven by the demand. And even Chapo Guzman, that drug criminal that's locked up in New York, and thank God he's locked up, he said, when they bring drugs across the border, or when he brought drugs across the border, they bring it through ports of entry. What happens to people in this caravan? Have people who made it all the way to the border, were never even able to get an interview, do they get despondent and turn around and go home? Which is what Trump is trying to get them to do? Or or are they just kind of just hanging out there waiting and waiting and waiting? Yeah, about a third do go back. The other third still have that dream of, of coming into the United States or going to another country. Because some of them have even thought about going to Canada or other parts of the world because they're escaping violence or hunger in their home country. And that's something that a lot of people don't realize, that this flow of people crossing borders has been going on since the beginning of time, just as caravans have. The exodus from Egypt, the stagecoaches coming from the East Coast to the West Coast. If they're from Europe, they're great-great-grandparents who were escaping the potato famine or political persecution in Europe and came to the United States. Those types of caravans have been going on since the beginning of time. People travel in numbers because they want to have safety. That is not unusual. What's unusual is that you have a lunatic at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue that's promoting hate, lies, racism, sexism, and he's somewhat getting away with it. Immigration's at a record low at the border. Two-thirds of the people either turn around and go back home or try to go to another country. Country and, a, and the other third are just kind of mulling around the border. So from a Trump perspective, he's doing what people who support him want to see. Is that true or no? Not true because the undocumented migration, the record of those, it's been going on since the last 10 years. It actually started under President Obama's administration. But the economy got better in Mexico. So that's why we're not crossing in those types of numbers anymore. So the numbers are a lot lower now, but you know what Trump likes to do is take credit for these things, just like the economy. The economy getting stronger, not even Donald Trump could stop that economic surge in the United States. Not even Trump could stop it, but he'll take the credit for it. So as far as the undocumented migration has nothing to do with Trump, I assure you, none of these people are saying, oh, I'm not gonna cross because they might take my children away. They are desperate. I was recently speaking in a synagogue and I was talking about how these people from Central America either have their children killed in front of them in El Salvador or Honduras, or they risk sending them north looking for a better life. There's more than 3,000 children at this moment separated from their parents, and the U.S. government has no idea where one or the other is. This is the worst of the American spirit. I, I agree. Now, I also understand that Trump said in this past month that he wants to eliminate the international funding that the United States gives to Honduras, Guatemala, El Salvador if the immigration caravans don't stop. How is that going to impact the people of Central America? How is that going to impact immigration? Right. The United States doesn't give very much money to Central America. Now Trump has taken that away. Most of that money was not going directly to the governments down there. It was going to NGOs. We weren't one of those NGOs. So by taking that money away from those NGOs that were doing great work, that's going to be counterproductive. You know, they should have been giving more money to those NGOs. I remember uh, Congressman Cuellar from Texas once said, the United States does not have a billion dollar club in Central America or 
or Latin America for that matter. And I didn't know what he was talking about. What he meant was that the United States for many decades has given billions of dollars of aid to the Middle East because of the oil situation. They want the oil. But in Latin America, they don't give them billions of dollars. They should give billions of dollars because the United States is greatly responsible for what is taking place down there. Whether it was the creation of the gangs when Reagan interfered in El Salvador, whether it's the demand for the illegal drugs, the taking of the resources from those countries. There's 200 countries in the world and the United States consumes more than 35% of the world's illegal drugs, is the number two consumer of natural resources from other countries, and it's not in the top 20% when it comes to welcoming migrants. It should be number one. So by taking money away, the limited money that they were giving Central America, and this money's been given by, by several administrations, that hurts the issue, doesn't help it. It's counterproductive. How much money do you think it would take for the United States to get these countries maybe a little more stable? And the United States has plenty of money. They should, they should do something like the Marshall Plan, like the United States did after World War II, where it helped rebuild Germany and Japan, etc. Mexico is actually doing something like that. Mexico, with President Obrador, has started doing like a Marshall Plan in Central America to help those countries so they can find job security in their home countries. The U.S. should do more of that. And the people in Central America, just like people anywhere, they don't want to leave their homeland. They'd rather stay in their homeland. But when you have a desperate situation like many of them have, they're not coming by choice. They're coming because they have to. So if there's a Marshall-like plan in Central America by the United States, which has more than enough money to do that, then that will help those people stay in their homeland, and it creates a better situation for everybody. William Barr, the new U.S. attorney, said he wants to start jailing asylum seekers after they pass their credible fear interview. They've come to the border, they have shown that they have a credible fear, a basic case for asylum that should be heard, and wants to put them in jail. What do you think about this? I know what you think about this, but I'll, I'll let you expand on it. Well, uh, William Barr is a total Trumper. You have seen what Trump has done with his cabinet. People are forced to resign. They resign. They decide they don't get uh, endorsed and so on and so forth. William Barr, to the surprise of many, and many of us were not surprised, has been a tremendous disappointment. And Trump is by no means a very intelligent person, but he's surrounded himself with these other people that have these types of attitudes. And this is insane. These people are escaping a horrific situation in their homeland. They've traveled a long distance, a lot of it walking, thousands of miles. Finally, they make it to the United States. They're seeking asylum. They're going to have their asylum hearing. And now he wants to put them in prison? They haven't done anything wrong. They haven't done anything wrong. The person that belongs in prison is Donald Trump. My family is from Mexico. When we have corruption in Mexico, and we, like every country in the world, has it, that affects Mexico. When the United States has corruption, that affects the whole world. There is no comparison. We're not going to see any changes in immigration law, at least until, I would assume, the next presidential election. But what kind of changes in immigration law would you like to see that would make sense? One group of people that are heroes are the dreamers. We need to have a Clean Dream Act, and both sides of the aisle actually agree on that. So let's have a Clean Dream Act, which means not only do they become residents, but their parents that are probably undocumented, they're not persecuted. That's what the Clean Dream Act is all about. I agree with you. I don't think citizenship is as important as giving people green cards. I would trade, give a green card, and wait 15, 20 years to become a citizen, or maybe never become a citizen, uh, versus the situation where we're in now, fighting that you get a green card and can become a citizen in five years. I think it's so much more important that people have a humane situation be given to them. It's more about humanity now than how fast you're going to become a citizen. That's right. And then another policy that I would do is have more of a policy like Canada has, uh, like part some of Europe has, where the people can come into the country, as long as they're not a criminal, and overwhelmingly the grand majority are not criminals, let them come in through the front door. That way we know who they are. So when the Border Patrol is chasing these migrants today to death in car chase, or pulling out their guns and shooting across the border. That's not supposed to be taking place. But then they justify it by saying, oh, but they're criminals. Most are not criminals. Enrique, where can people find out more about Border Angels? The easiest is our website, borderangels.org. But we're all on the social media platforms, Facebook, Instagram. We're based in San Diego, and uh, we're always looking for volunteers. We have a GoFundMe page right now for donations. We also have a gift registry. If people say, hey, I want to send some shoes or some items to the refugees down in, in Mexico, you can go through the registry, it says what we need, you register, and then they send the donations here to our office in San Diego. And we take them down on weekends to the refugee
refugees and the, the shelters in Tijuana, we have something called Caravans of Love. People from all over Southern California come down and they bring donations and they join us as we caravan down to Tijuana to bring these donations. And you also have a weekly podcast called Bad Hombre. Where do we hear that? Every Monday, we have at high noon the podcast called Bad Hombre. And then shortly after that, we had one of our superstar border angels on Mex- in the Mexican side, Gaba, and she said, hey, how about me? So she started our podcast, and that one is called Bad Mujer. <laughs> so we have Bad Hombre, we have Bad Mujer, we have Love Has No Border t-shirts. We have a lot of items that you can purchase that also helps us with our nonprofit work. And Enrique, finally, we ask you every time, but I'm going to ask you again, tell me what your American dream is. Well, as far as the, uh, the dream that I have is that we all create a better world for everybody. Whether that better world is created by staying in your home country or by crossing a state or another country in, anywhere in the world, we are the example that we want other people to follow. So I say that we should act in a loving way to all communities, gay, straight, Christian, or Jew, and do that in actions, not in just words. Enrique Baronis, thank you very much, founder and executive director of Border Angels. Appreciate the update on what's going on in the border, and I hope you can come join us again soon and give us another update, and hopefully that update will be a little more positive. Thank you. Muchas gracias. I'd be happy to. Okay. Thanks. Adios.